Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization, and I'm joined by a guest and a friend, Menno Henselmans from the world. I was going to say the Netherlands, but he really is a citizen of the world, a digital nomad, an international man of mystery, and he's here to answer a few questions that have been posed to both he and myself on various social media platforms, Gawker, Tinder, uh, the dark web, and all those kinds of just normal social media. Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera dot net dot gov dot mom. And um, here we go. Ready for some questions? Let's roll. All right. Question number one. What is both of our... Do you want to just answer these as averages? Our average one around height and weight. <laughs> if you can calculate it. <laughs> um, height, weight, and current body fat percentage. Meno? You're the guest. I'll start so my stats don't look so insanely <laughs> ridiculous compared to his. Uh, I'm six foot one, about uh, 185 centimeters. I'm about 200 pounds, a good 90 kilograms, uh, around 10% body fat. I'll be a bit heavier, like 205, up to 210 if I go heavy during a bulk. In contest prep, I'm a bit lighter. Boom. Now for the really ridiculous numbers. Right, well, the height's not so ridiculous. I'm 5'6", which is like a meter 69, and that's right, 69. <laughs> Uh, I weigh currently 235 pounds and I'm right around 10% body fat as well. Just take a moment to realize how absurd those numbers are. Well, you know, some of us, uh, you know what I'm saying? Just not, I'm not going to incriminate myself. Next joke. All right. Number two, lifting stats, one RMs of bench press, back squat, deadlift, and overhead press. I can start this one out and say, I don't know any of those. Because I train for hypertrophy and I don't do anything below sets of five and haven't for years. Back when I was a power lifter, my best bench press in competition was 385 pounds. Best squat in competition was 490. Best deadlift was 567. And best overhead press back in the day, back in the day, was 225 for four. Since then, as a hypertrophy trainee, my PRs over the past several years... In the bench press, I've done 365 for eight with no arch and no retraction. I've back squatted 500 pounds, 227.5 for 10 high bar. Um, and these are full squats, not powerlifting squats. I've deadlifted from a three inch deficit with no belt conventional, 550 or 250 kilos for five. And I have overhead pressed, and this is on video, 125 kilos, 275 pounds for eight full repetitions standing uh, at a body weight of 240 pounds. I, I'm about... I <laughs> hear that. <laughs> a bit over 300 uh, bench, so a bit over 140. Uh, squats a bit over 400 high bar. I could do probably more low bar. Um, deadlift is uh, about 550, a bit more. Uh, overhead press is a bit over body weight. Um, so I think I did 84 times six, one of my 84 times eight, I think. One of my better lifts. Uh, Romanian deadlift is probably my best lift. There are the 200 kilo times 16, also on YouTube. Um, yeah, that's, that was the list, right? Yeah. Number three, favorite lift and most hated lift. Please start us off with both, now. Um, I really like deadlifts and overhead presses because I'm good at them. Um, so those are probably my favorite lifts. But I actually don't deadlift that much um, because I don't think it's very ideal for... Uh, Muscle hypertrophy, so I mainly do Romanian deadlifts. Yeah. And least favorite? Yeah. Anything like Bulgarian split squats, one-legged lunges, pistols, any one-legged squat stuff, I definitely hate. Hmm. Man, most hated lift for me, it's tough because I have many kinds of hatred on several different categories. One is experiential hatred, like it hurts me to do the lift and it doesn't feel good. One is like a technical hatred where it's a stupid lift and I think nobody should be doing it. Um, I say my favorite lift, if I had to just choose one lift of all of them, would probably be the high bar squat, uh, Olympic weightlifting style. It's just something sitting deep and upright in a high bar squat. It's kind of magic. My body was built for it completely. So I love that. And as far as like most uh, hated lift or one that I really don't like... Um, I would say, gee, oh, uh, cable rope tricep pushdown. It just hurts my elbows, and that's all it does. I swear to God, it doesn't do anything else. That's it. Yeah. Good tip, random tip, by the way, on uh, triceps training, because a lot of people get elbow injuries from them. Move the arm around. So do them with a supinated grip. Uh, for a lot of people, 
that solves a lot of issues with uh, push downs and the like. Yep. And if you're going to do that, get some Versa grips so that your thumb is not the limiting factor on the lift. Back squat, high bar or low bar? Um, I'll answer first. I prefer high bar for hypertrophy. I think it feels better. I think it's more sustainable because it doesn't fuck up all your joints. Low bar is by far the best if you are able to get into the position for strength uh, and for competitive powerlifting. It's awesome outside of for competitive powerlifting, even for the building of basic strength. I think high bar is better. Uh, low bar has a number of problems. Um, it'll hurt either your fore or your wrists, your elbows, your shoulders, uh, or all of those. Uh, if you're sized more on the large side, the large people have very, very hard time low bar squatting. Um, but uh, so, so what I would say is, you know, for people who are training for hypertrophy or basic strength, low bar squatting is probably not a good idea, not worth the trade-offs. If you're training for powerlifting, do it insofar as it's good for powerlifting, but all your supplementary work, et cetera, should probably be high bar. Yeah. I'd start by saying that uh, for powerlifters, for sure, it's basically low bar. Even if you think it's high bar, then objectively for performance, it should biomechanically be low bar. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, I actually wrote an article. If you go on my site and you search squat myths, um, I show that for muscle growth and for most purposes, they are not that different. Like some people act like they're completely different lifts, you know? And the main differences are how they influence joint torques and a little bit range of motion, but muscle activity is very comparable between high and low bar squats. And it's much a matter of personal comfort and which joints are more sensitive. Generally, I err on the side of high bar for men, low bar for women, because women don't tend to have as many uh, hip problems. And they also have the flexibility to do low bar squats well, and they want to focus on the hips more, whereas men typically want to focus more on the quads uh, and do well with high bar for the reasons Mike mentions. I think it's an overall probably better, safer lift in terms of stimulus to fatigue ratio. Deadlift, conventional or sumo? Actually, co-authored, um, I think the only paper on this that investigates whether powerlifters uh, or whether people should deadlift conventional or sumo in terms of what they're best at, uh, in terms of body structure, like anthropometrically. Uh, and we found that it doesn't really seem to matter. Like we found some very slight trends, uh, but overall it's basically a matter of personal preference. Uh, and of course, what you're used to. So we did it in deadlift trains, but deadlift naive individuals. And we found that body structure did not influence what you're strongest at. So it's probably almost exclusively a matter of personal preference for strength, that is, um, and what you've done before. So a lot of people think, oh, I'm much better strong sumo or much better conventional because they've been doing it that way for the past months. Um, so try both, see what you're strongest at for muscle growth. Uh, though the answer is, I'd say definitely conventional for most people. In general, I'm not really a fan of uh, either deadlift, honestly, for muscle growth. I think Romanian deadlifts. If you really want to do deadlifts for muscle growth, it would be like deficit deadlifts, snatch bar deadlifts with uh, a controlled eccentric contraction. Yeah. I would just add, I agree with all that. I would just add that deficit sumo deadlifting for many people is a very great way to stimulate adductor and glute uh, growth. But then someone could say, why don't you just do deep uh, sumo squats? And there's not mm. really any really good response to that. It's usually they're correct. Um, so, uh, you know, conventional probably is better for back hypertrophy and for really skinny people for whom no number of bent rows is enough because they're still too weak and too small. Conventional deadlifts can beef up your fucking back for sure. Um, I would just do them, like Meadow said, probably from a deficit, probably with a great degree of eccentric control, which is just to say that the lift becomes very, very painful and annoying but you know what i'm saying muscle growth ain't easy neither is pimping all right team calves or team no calves um i'm not an incel on reddit so i have no idea what the fuck these things mean <laughs> uh, i wasn't never part of a team uh but on a serious note uh, i think if you don't like a bit of a lone wolf <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you remember the dog fight we saw earlier a couple days ago between mm -hmm. uh, maggie and zeus like that that's the kind of wolf i am we, uh, we were at a, a dog fight. Meadow and I were attending a dog fight and uh, we had two dogs in the fight. They're both uh, mixed Frenchie and English bulldogs. It was a ferocious. There was so much growling and, and friendly play. Anyway. Um, they were you, friendly dogs. They were, <laughs> that's right. We don't actually go to dog fights. No, it was an actual dog fight. Just, just in case YouTube is going to go in an uproar. <laughs> yeah. um, but on a serious note, uh, look, uh, here's the thing. If you don't give a shit about your calves, fuck them. You, but that applies to every muscle group. Like if someone's like, oh my God, your calves are small. You're like, yep, like, I don't train them. What are they going to say? Like, 
Mm, that's it. But if you want big calves, sweet. Big calves look great. Yeah. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, um, if you want bigger calves, you got to train them. And the same principles apply as any other muscle group. If you Google three reasons your calves aren't growing, uh, I wrote a good article on that, on what you can expect realistically in terms of growth from them genetically and ways that most people fail to train their calves uh, when they do want them to get bigger. Yeah, just quick uh, summary of how to train calves. Train them very infrequently, probably once a week, maybe once every uh, two weeks. You want to only do bent raises and use as much weight as possible. So it just kind of just do this. Very limited range of motion. That's the way to get big calves. Hmm. For a moment when you started, I was like, I think we're going to have a different answer on this one. <laughs> You're right. I said too much. Uh, every two weeks at most. Probably every three. <laughs> um, but on a serious note, I probably could predict what you said about calves. They respond well to a very high frequency of training when they're not sore, train them again, a high degree of range of motion and mostly with straight legs. And you'd be surprised that uh, high repetition ranges actually affect calf training very, very well. So don't train them like you would a deadlift very infrequently with very low reps and low sets uh, and very limited range of motion. Train them with a high degree of range of motion, emphasize an eccentric, super big stretch, train them as often as they recover and be patient because they take a while to grow. Yep. And have a good hard hitting exercise. Like I like calf jumps with eccentric overloading because the calves can handle that stuff. Uh, and don't always do your calf work at the end of your workouts. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. People are like, man, my rear delts won't grow. And they have like presses, side raises, side raises, presses, and then one set of like rear delt flies. You're like, wow, yeah. weird, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, good, good call. All right, favorite food you would have no issue eating every single day. Actually, the most, most things I eat, I eat every single day. Uh, and most of those recipes are on my website, but um, if what? I could just eat whatever I wanted, um, which I do most days, uh, I eat sushi. I could eat sushi every day. Sushi. I could also eat sushi every day, but the thing I would, if someone's like, okay, you have to eat this every day, pasta. Pasta. I could swim in a sea of pasta. If I was an astronaut and we approached a planet that was fettuccine Alfredo seas, I would take no life raft and just jump right in. Well, there he goes on about the pasta. <laughs> <laughs> the natives of that planet are like, oh, why are you coming from space? I'm like, I knew you guys would talk like that. Number eight, what can't you live without? Uh, I will actually answer that question directly. Modern medicine. And that applies to every single person watching this. No, no? Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> Sushi is medicine. Someone's like, you've got like coronavirus. You're like... Beep, sushi. Beep, give me sushi. <laughs> give me something scary. Sana runs in with like a bunch of rolls. An hour later, you're like, ah, take off the breather. <laughs> it needs wakame. <laughs> Maybe you got the wrong rolls. What is this? <laughs> Favorite book or movie? The or movie is for people like me who can't read. Thank you. Thank you for asking it that way. Yeah. I like a lot of um, movies and uh, series like uh, IMDb Top 250, that kind of stuff. Watched Ozark recently, like that. First season of Altered Carbon is great. Second season is eh. Uh, Boardwalk Empire is a great series. Shawshank Redemption is a good movie. So good. Yeah. Do you cry? No, I don't cry. Oh, like, period. <laughs> I think those those <laughs> organs don't function. Yeah, me neither, bro. Actually, yesterday, yesterday I cried from laughing with you. But. Right. Okay, that doesn't <laughs> count. Um, I cry every time I see Shawshank Redemption. If you want... To see me cry, just show me the scene where he approaches the boat towards the end. And I'm just like, <laughs> is it going to be friends again? I'm legitimately considering crying right now. I can't think about that movie. Uh, my answer is Forrest Gump. I, I was going to say that. Yeah, my wife and I is. watch Forrest Gump at least once a year prophylactically. And we both cry together. Multiple times through the movie. Um, as far as... Uh, so that's like one of my favorite movies. My favorite movie of all time is uh, Ghost in the Shell with uh, Scarlett Johansson. I have no particular affinity for her, but Ghost in the Shell is as close to a religion as far as I can tell, as far as a movie is approached. Like, Jared Feather and I both want to die in an Asian super future mega city surrounded by half machine, half human hybrids. Like, ooh, everything about the movie, like, yes, yes, more. Um, as far as books, uh, favorite book is probably, I don't know, it's very tough to talk about favorites, but favorite book that I recommend to many other people is Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. If you want to make sense of the world and then begin to hate a lot of people who comment on economics, read that book. It'll fill you with evil. Yeah. Other good books, Free Economics, uh, Daniel Gilbert's books, Jonathan Haidt's books, like The Happiness yeah, Hypothesis. Really um, those are great. Stephen Pinker's books. Oh, Stephen Pinker. The Blank Slate. Good God. Enlightenment Now. 
Good Lord. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to rip off Jonathan Haidt's work and make some money on a published book. It would call it like the happiness theorem <laughs> and just cite all his work. Be like, hypothesis, please. I can do better than that. The happiness postulate. All right. Number 10, a quote that defines your life slash values. Tolerance is the virtue of a man without conviction. God damn. That's like uh, you just made a position against the idea of tolerance. It's pretty fucking sweet. Yeah. God damn. Um, pimping ain't easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick with that. <laughs> seems um, good. <laughs> it, it seemed right at the time. <laughs> it seemed right. It's still right now. Uh, it's still right again. Uh, honestly, a quote that defines your life and values. You know, uh, there is uh, a quote on my Facebook by an economist, Thomas Sowell, so a man I deeply respect, that's essentially to the extent of like, you know, don't confuse cleverness and wisdom. Uh, that, that comes pretty close. Um, I would also say that, um, uh, quote, a paraphrase of Ayn Rand, uh, that the, the the meaning of one's life is their work is much actually more accurate of what my life's all about. Uh, if you know if uh, if you have you do meaningful productive work that you enjoy uh, and it helps others and improves everyone else's life, I think that comes pretty close to you being a fucking baller human. But this way, if you have a meaningful productive job and you're helping other people uh, as a functioning member of society, I don't have any fundamental beef with you. Like, yeah, he's a Russian Jew, so he's all about that Arbeit macht stuff. <laughs> what the fuck kind of Nazi <laughs> shit was that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. All right, so um, number... Oh, and it says, send me, a hola. Send me mm. a hola in your native language. You go first. Здравствуйте. Очень приятно с вами разговаривать на нашем диване. Смену. All right, this is going to seem a bit anticlimactic after that. Hello. <laughs> oh, my God. You don't even speak Dutch, do you? He just puts on a fake accent. He's from Oklahoma. He's Tiger my, King's my, son. My accent isn't even Dutch. Nobody can guess where I'm from based on my accent. Though. I would just yeah. say you're generically Northern European. <laughs> you think, you think you know, most of Northern Europe is like a country. Sweden-ish. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question. What Olympic sport do you find the most impressive and why? Pole vaulting and Olympic weightlifting for me, probably. Just they're so technical. Uh, I wish strongman was an Olympic sport. That would be sweet. Actually, I don't wish that because they would drug test it and ruin the whole fucking sport. It would just be drug scandals all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish it received the attention of Olympic sports. and had the formal organized competition, yeah. but without the ridiculous drug fiascos. Um... To me, the most impressive, I would have to say marathon, uh, to watch an Ethiopian man with a smile on his face at mile number 16 going 600 miles an hour. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> and he's like, wee! I'm like, I would be first dead and second of all, miserable in death. Um, super impressive. I can't like, I can't even relate to that level of effort and, and uh, being okay with pain. Just like, all right. All right. Next one. What exercises that are huge effective, you don't do it because you hate them? No, I think that's the same answer for both of us. We'll we do them anyway. <laughs> yeah. But I do hate split squats and the like. <laughs> I hate split squats too. I don't do them because I do walking lunges instead, which I also hate. <laughs> no, I don't hate walking lunges, but um, uh, oh, I actually have a good answer to this. Uh, curls. I don't like to curl. I don't even like to train my biceps. Uh, I love to train my triceps. I love them to death. I train biceps begrudgingly. I hate every part of it. I have just a dog shit mind muscle connection. Incline dumbbell curls recently have been like an exercise that has like worked pretty well for me, but I still don't even like it that much. Um, any kind of curl, I'm like, nah. Which is stupid, right? Because that's what everyone else's like favorite exercise. Yeah. I like doing curls when I'm lean in contour shapes. It's nice. In front of a mirror, of course. Next question. Second to last one. If testosterone is low, but in the normal range, do you think there could be any benefit of Borobo and zinc supplementation? Boron, I guess. Boron. Is it boron? What the fuck? What are you, like, <laughs> nuclear reactor powered alien? I need boron. <laughs> yeah, no, it's only beneficial if you're deficient in either. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're uh, sub subclinical or uh, whatever your testosterone level is. If you're deficient in zinc or boron, you'll probably experience an increase in testosterone levels if you supplement it. Otherwise, you won't. So for most people, you probably won't have to. Although zinc is actually a bit more difficult than most people realize to consume enough of. If you don't consume red meat or shellfish in your diet uh, or organ meat, then it's uh, it's quite likely you would actually benefit from uh, zinc supplementation, at least in terms of 
well-being or libido, um, and in the long term, possibly also for your gains. Um, I actually only eat shellfish that were fed cattle during their farming. Like it's like a like a pond, a mini artificial pond of shrimp, <laughs> and the, the cows like Wah, and they just push it in. And the shrimp devastate the shit. They're like piranha shrimp. Um, so I have no problems. Like yeah, Meadow's answer was great. I have nothing to add. Mm-hmm. Last question: When someone has a hard time. Uh, to grow and feel a muscle group, can you find any benefit of implementing pre-fatigue? I would say the number one thing you want to do is look for exercises which you can have a better mind-muscle connection, specifically perceiving a high degree of tension through the target muscle during movement. A lot of times, once you find a great exercise or several, you just do them first and they function both as the fatigue and the pre-fatigue at the same time. But if some exercises, just there's no exercise that's really amazing for you, but isolating it with pre-fatigue makes your perception of the muscle and makes it the limiting factor on other movements. For example, cable flies aren't that great for your chest, neither is inclined barbell press. But if you do cable flies before barbell press for multiple sets and get close to failure, on the barbell press, you feel your pecs as the limiting factor to the movement much more, usually your triceps are, um, then I think it's probably worth the trade-off. I just wouldn't go there first. If someone says to me, hey, incline barbell press, I can't feel my chest, my first thing would be to work on their technique on the incline barbell press. My second would be to look for alternate compound high force uh, production exercises for the chest that they feel better. Um, and another thing I could tell them is like, look, you may, uh, the mind muscle connection is something that really makes a difference in advanced individuals. Most individuals by the time they're advanced have no problem feeling a shitload of exercises because their technique is so good. The mind muscle connection is so practiced. If you're a beginner or intermediate, you say I have a problem with mind muscle connection with feeling, I would just tell you shut the fuck up and keep incline barbell pressing and get much stronger and your pecs will grow. So there's my answer for that. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Uh, overall, it's much better to find an exercise that you don't need to do pre-fatigue for, like a compound exercise. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's compound or isolation. You just want a good exercise for a muscle group. The overall literature on pre-fatiguing is very, very unconvincing. For example, for a flat marble bench press, there have been at least two studies showing that if you do pec deck before a flat marble bench press, your tricep activity is actually higher than the bench press. So you may feel your pecs more because they have more neuromuscular fatigue and uh, metabolic stress, but it's the triceps that's actually objectively doing more work and muscle activity in the pecs is the same. So for, for most muscle groups, uh, all it does is you induce a weak link. If you already have an effective exercise, like the flat barbell bench press for the pecs, you do flies before that, you just induce a weak link uh, and you decrease your total wo- work volume. So it's not going to be uh, net beneficial. It's going to be basically the same for the pre-fatigue muscle group and worse for the other muscle groups. Same with doing uh, uh, I think other studies um, look at leg extensions before squats or leg presses. Also doesn't benefit the quads. It just makes uh, the squats or leg presses worse for your glutes, back, etc. Yeah, but if it's a systemic fatigue from these exercises, if your normal ranges are is so high that it interferes with when you train those other target muscles later, then pre-fatigue can be a strategy by very big and very strong people to just make the session more focused to the muscles you want and not to the muscles you don't. But overall, hypertrophy for the whole body is not enhanced by pre-fatigue unless you use it in that very strategic and and quite, uh, quite, to be honest, laborious and time-consuming way. So the worst is when people are like, yeah, I work out four times a week and I'm pre-fatiguing my chest. I'm like, for the love of fucking God. But if you're a huge bodybuilder and you're tired of bench pressing 400 fucking you know, pounds for reps to get your pecs to grow and your joints are really beat up, pre-fatiguing is a good idea from a stimulus to fatigue perspective, but like Menno implied, not from a raw stimulus magnitude perspective. Yeah. Boom. All right. All right. On to Facebook. Yeah. The book, a, of, the book of Faces. Got a couple more questions couple from more my questions Facebook page. From Menno's then, Facebook. Uh... John Caputo asks, assuming an advanced trainee, if the trainee is making consistent strength progress over time, three or more months, then is it likely that hypertrophy is occurring even if the volume is low? If they are gaining weight, yes. If not, uh, it depends on the magnitude of strength increase. The general rule of thumb I have is that if without specific powerlifting training, so you're not doing 1RMs and the like, but you're, you're focused on bodybuilding type training and you gain at least 20% strength on a non-novel exercise, it's very likely that you are gaining muscle mass. Now, overall, especially in the long term in more advanced lifters doing non-novel exercises, so exercises they're used to doing, you don't get newbie gains, then there is a very 
strong correlation between strength and muscle growth. But gaining up to 20% strength on a new lift doesn't have to mean much. That could be almost entirely neuromuscular, uh, neural specifically adaptations rather than morphological ones like muscle growth. Yeah, and three months, you can gain neural strength adaptation for a year or more. Uh, and so three months really isn't a very good cutoff point. Then to say, if the volume is low, well, if the volume is low, the probability, so like Menno said, you know, if the, if the volume is high and you're gaining weight, then yeah, there's a pretty good chance you're gaining muscle. If you're not gaining weight and the volume is low, or let's just say if the volume is very low, just probabilistically, if Menno and I had to guess, we wouldn't be as certain that you're gaining muscle. If, if someone said like, I'm gaining strength for over three months and I'm doing like, you know, 20 sets per muscle group, in the 10 to 20 rep range, am I gaining muscle? Menno and I would probably be like, yeah, maybe. If someone was like, okay, but I'm doing three sets per week per muscle group, but I'm getting stronger, am I getting muscle? We'd be like, uh, like maybe, but I'd certainly less of a bet. So if you you're really, what you really wanna do is make sure your training volume is sufficient to cause gains by experiment of incrementally, very slowly adjusting to do higher and higher volumes and see if you are gaining rep strength faster. Um, and if you are, then for sure, you're now gaining more muscle and potentially even more uh, neural adaptations as well. So uh, what I wouldn't do, John, is, is say, just weld yourself to the low training volume idea and, and be like, oh, I hope I'm growing muscle. Like you can find an organic volume that enhances your chances of growing muscle independently of being attached to one volume level or another. All right. Yep. Kevin Cockerham. That's a sweet name. How relevant do you think uh, HRV is as an indicator of fatigue? Mm. I've actually written a couple posts about this uh, and the literature is quite unanimous that HRV is a very poor measure of strength training, neuromuscular fatigue. There have been several studies that looked at its ability to predict performance, its ability to uh, modulate training frequency when you train, like you train when HRV is, is positive, um, doesn't enhance muscle growth. Um, it doesn't correlate with neuromuscular fatigue. Pretty much any measure you do, it's, its measures are confounded majorly by whether you're standing or you're seated, by what time of day you do the measurements. So basically it is a whole lot of noise. And probably worst of all, it can induce a huge nocebo effect that I've seen in many clients, many clients that have come to me and said, HRV, I'm tracking HRV, it works really well because when I look at the measure in the morning and it says, your workout's gonna suck, then indeed my workout suck. But that's because you read it, you think, oh, my workout's gonna suck, you give it a half-assed effort, and then indeed your workout sucks, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whereas if HRV says, you're gonna get an amazing workout, you go to the gym wild up, you give more effort, you're more motivated, indeed the workout's good, you're just propelling this self-fulfilling prophecy and it's not that the data is actually telling you anything. HRV, I think for most, Purposes for a strength trainee, at least, is nigh useless. Yeah, uh, James Hoffman and I have uh, uh, an article on juggernaut, strength, uh, juggernaut training systems about the multiple time courses of detecting fatigue. And we say there about HIV and actually all of the heart variable stuff is, if anything, it's a lagging indicator of fatigue. Like by the time that stuff is predictably disrupted, you're really, really fucked up. Um, in addition to that, it works because Matt, like Meno said, it's a really stochastic element. Like it's really just, there's tons of noise. It works really uh, decently for large teams of athletes to see if the total training volume exposing the whole team is too high. Um, and it works decently well over incredibly long measurement periods, but because it's a lagging indicator, it doesn't actually tell you anything you don't already know. Like by the time heart rate variability is really, really fucked up to the point where you're like, oh wow, this is clearly a trend. You, you know, someone's gonna be like, okay, well, are you surprised? You're like, no, I'm super fucked up. I knew I was beat up, right? So it's one of those like, um, uh, like what James Hoffman would say, it's like a collecting data without knowing how to use the data well. A lot of people are collecting because it's numbers, it's science, but it's like, okay, yeah. what does this tell you that you didn't already know? Is it worth the data collection? It's like, it's like uh, trying to analyze whether or not there's clouds outside by doing like a spectrogram analysis of the colors coming in. Like, why don't you fucking look outside? Be like, oh, there's no clouds. Be like, all right, we don't need to see how much blue light versus white light or whatever. So same idea. Sorry, it always sounds so unscientific when we do shit like that, you know? Like, are you sore? No, then you're fine. Yeah, like, well, okay. that's a good point. Like collecting data does not make something scientific. It has to be applied science. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just yeah. I mean, you time. can you can track your your heart rate, your HRV, your step count, your your calories. If you're not adhering to the diet, you know, it doesn't matter that you're tracking all of those things. For sure. Um, all right, Shane Duquette. 
says, if we're doing, say, four sets of eight reps on a big compound lift, how does resting five minutes between sets compare with resting two hours between sets? For instance, someone doing chin-ups as a part of a 75-minute workout versus doing a set of chin-ups before each meal. What? <laughs> so, like, let's right, say, okay, yeah, 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 do yeah. chin-ups four so, times yeah. in two minutes. Actually, I have an uh, interesting anecdote about this. At the first gym I trained at um, in Gorkum in the Netherlands, the gym owner there was a huge guy, and he managed the whole gym himself and also the cafeteria outside. And he cleaned it. He, uh, he repaired all the machines. He just managed everything. And he also gave some classes, managed the reception, answered the phone. So he never had time to actually do a full workout. He worked basically from getting up. It was his gym. He also lived upstairs. And then he went to bed afterwards. So he never had time to do an actual workout. So he'd do all of his training as like one set. And then he'd go answer the phone or he'd help someone at reception. One more set. And throughout the whole day, he basically interspersed just his daily activities with like sets of what he was supposed to do in his workouts. And that can work perfectly well. Basically, it, it sort of... Hints at the intersection between rest interval and training frequency. You know, when is it still a rest interval? When are you talking by daily workouts? And the effects are quite the same. They increase total training volume. If you rest longer so that you can do more volume with your next set because you don't have as much neuromuscular fatigue, especially metabolic stress, you're going to be able to do more volume. And to the extent that you can recover productively from that volume, it's going to enhance your gains. So it's actually positive. It's just really time inefficient and potentially... Um, problematic if you have to warm up every time before you do one set of chin-ups. Boom. So that was going to be, I have two sort of theoretical, uh, one practical critique and one theoretical critique. From a theoretical critique, there may be a minimum amount, especially for advanced athletes, that they have to present as far as disruption per any given session, per any given stimulus. And uh, anything less might just maintain their muscle versus incrementally increase it. Uh, we know that muscle growth is not a linear add sand to the pile kind of growth. It's more like constructing a skyscraper where if you don't have enough electrical equipment for the next floor, none of that floor might actually be functional. So, you know, satellite cell incorporation, myonuclear domain expansion, some of that may, may have to keep an open mind to this kind of stuff, work in slightly nonlinear ways where only the presentation of a really superlative stimulus gives you at some point any growth. And anything less than that, even if it's pretty hard, even if it's very spread out, might do a whole lot of nothing except for maintain your gains. That's a theoretical critique that we have to be open to. There's no direct data on it, but it, it also very few people have ever gotten super jacked doing the training in this very first person, which shouldn't say that it doesn't work, but it should be like, you know, maybe I'm not going to put all of my stock into expecting these super gains. Maybe I'll try it out and see what happens. But my bigger critique is from a practical perspective, men already alluded to it, um, for good training to activate very high threshold motor units safely, in some muscles requires warming up, sometimes extensively. And if you do training, which you essentially just don't warm up, uh, then every one of those sets of pull-ups might just not be that great of a set. And then you have to do much more overall volume to get the same effect, and that tends to beat up your joints, so on and so forth. Um, and if you say, okay, I'm going to warm up, then you're doing a whole fuckload of working out throughout the day, warming up, and then one set and then warming up, and then one set. And if you're warmed up, you might as well do a few sets and give a good response and give some time for recovery. So if you do forearm training, calf training, bicep training, I think that kind of like interspersed method is totally fine and very practical and probably very effective, short of the theoretical constraints. But I think if you're in a position where uh, if you're doing... The next question is pretty fun. This is the next one right here. Uh, right there from Del uh, Altino or whatever. If you're doing uh, something like quads something like back, something like chest or, or show like overhead pressing, I think that you're going to run into a problem where you have to warm up anyway, so you might as well do some work. We answered all the ones below already. All right, interesting. How does a Bayesian like you and a scientist like Mike view spirituality and religion? So as a Bayesian, the answer to religion is because there's no good data to support uh, the belief that there is a certain deity or whatever, uh, you don't believe it. That is the Bayesian answer to the question. Yeah, agreed. Spirituality. Spirituality is real. You know, how you feel connected to other people and connected to the world and how you drive your own meaning uh, is a function of, of brain structure. 
Uh, and all primates have it and humans have it uh, pretty extensively and it requires a lot of exploration and there's a lot of sort of coming to grips with reality and thinking things through and um, learning how to cooperate with yourself and others. And I think there's some very beautiful discoveries there and a community aspect can help a lot and a lot of thinking and feeling your way through can help. So spirituality is real and I think most people should have some kind of connectedness, some kind of general grand meaning, an openness to being inspired. But I think uh, religion is, uh, well, gee, was, uh, what's the least politically incorrect thing I can say is almost <laughs> certainly false on every level. All right, next question. Uh, uh, uh. Incorporating very long, like day plus fasts on rest days for fat burning with almost no movements. Is that risky for fat loss or is that a good a way to lose fat? Basically, alternate day fasting, complete fasting. Is that good for fat loss is the question. And is it risky for muscle loss? Yeah, you can go first. Um, the same yeah, so let's see. Uh, it's Probably not super risky for muscle loss, but if you want maximum muscle retention, I would not not eat for a whole day or a day and a half. In addition to that, uh, physical activity is a really great way to boost fat burning. And if you have very, very low physical activity, that's probably not the best way to do things. What I would say is if you have to have low physical activity, like you mentioned in your question of office work or something like that, eating less, eating very little carbohydrate or not so much fat, but still keeping the amino acids coming into regular protein feedings is probably a much better uh, sort of middle ground versus just eating nothing at all. So I think like if you have like, just to keep it super simple example, three casein shakes throughout the day of like each one of 80 grams of protein, that's gonna provide a very awesome anti-catabolic effect. And it's gonna cost you very little fat burning because it's just not enough calories to do dick on that side. And you have a really great day of minimal activity, which you have to do because you're in an office, but you still burn plenty of fat. I would prefer that much more than I would prefer completely getting away from eating altogether because then, yeah, you will lose some muscle and over time that probably will add up. And in addition to that, you mentioned, is that a good uh, way of getting amazing productivity? I, I never understand people that say, I never understand. I, I have a hard time understanding people that say like the productivity is boosted when they don't eat. Uh, eating gives you energy and it makes your brain work better. So if you eat, you're more prepared to do all the daily tasks. Now, yes, eating enormous meals of tons of carbohydrate makes you sleepy, but eating a good diet that it promotes energy and thought. Like if someone was like, hey, Mike, like here, work on this really meaningful, highly intellectual work. Do you want to be fed today or not? Like, of course I'm gonna fucking be fed. I don't wanna fucking be starving and trying to make sense of some shit. So I don't think that, the, that fasting for an entire day is productive. I think fasting for several hours in the morning can keep you nice and sharp, especially if you've had caffeine. But I think, you know, right around lunch, you're gonna to have to wanna to eat something if you wanna stay intellectually productive. Yeah, I think in general, I'm a, I can, I'm a pretty big fan of incorporating protein sparing modified fast days, which is basically what Mike said, you add the protein and essential nutrients. Um, to fuel overall health uh, and ward off muscle loss. Because a lot of people don't realize that if you don't eat at all and you add protein, you'll actually lose more fat generally. Because what the protein does, it's up until your requirements, which is at least 1.6 gram per kilogram per day for most people, that protein is used for protein synthesis. It's preferentially used for that by the body. It won't be used as energy, it won't be oxidized, and it won't be stored as fat. So it's basically free calories in that sense. Not only that, but that protein synthesis and those metabolic processes that the protein consumption feeds, those increase energy expenditure. So you end up with a higher total energy expenditure and no additional substrate used for uh, either energy usage or fat gain. So you actually end up losing more fat if you only eat protein versus if you eat nothing at all. On top of that, you ward off muscle loss and potentially even gain it. So uh, it's basically a win-win on, on every single front. Yeah, it, and that's my really my biggest gripe against fasting is not any of the technical stuff or feeding windows and fraction synthetic rates and stuff like that. My biggest gripe is like, I understand you're trying to lower calories. And that's the biggest benefit of fasting. Why are you getting rid of the protein feedings? There's no good reason to do that that I've been convinced by. People will say like, well, even having just protein throws off your fast. I'm like, yes. It's not fasting is yeah. not magical. There's nothing magical happening. Like, what about autophagy? Then you get all that bullshit of like, oh man, fasting promotes longevity with autophagy and all this stuff, which is all dog shit anyway. So um, that's the deal. Yeah. Eat protein, folks. This was the last question. So that's actually a good point to end it on. With many of these things, fasting, keto diets, paleo diets, the goal is not to eat paleo. The goal is not to be in ketosis. The goal is not to fast. The goal is to lose fat or be healthier or whatever. And those things are the means to that end. You always have to realize 
what you're doing, is it contributing to your end? Or is it just contributing to some arbitrary in-between ping that you're using as the means to that end? 100%. All right. That covers all the questions that we didn't get to in our previous Q&A sessions. We may be able to do one more Q&A session while I'm here in Philadelphia next week. Uh, not guaranteed. Uh, and otherwise, you can still ask questions on both our social media channels and we'll happily answer them. Boom. See you guys next time. All right.